right, it's time for us to get started. I'm sure a few more will be in. Um, good morning to you, Rod. I guess that little trick that we did didn't work exactly, but um, good thing is it didn't miss this morning. Let's see if we have everything ready to go. Let me get the recorder on and then we will be underway. Okay, I think that's it. Once again, good morning to everyone. Good morning to you, Stephen, and welcome back to another study on the book of Revelation. I took a day off last week, much needed day of rest, but we're back and we're on the downside now of the book of Revelation. <clears throat> and so only about uh, seven or eight chapters chapters to go, and uh, and that will map it out it's been an interesting journey still is still a lot to go and um and then we have to get to that great chapter uh, well a couple of them uh for the most part in terms of trying to figure out what's going on and that's chapter 17 and also revelation chapter 20 but uh we will get to those when we get to them so once again thank you for uh being here this morning and we're going to talk about the 144,000 and the uh, victory over the mark of the beast. So let's um, let's begin. In our last session, we talked about the mark of the beast and the number of his name, and I suggested that Daniel chapter three is the source text for the imagery of the mark of the beast and uh, making the image to uh, the beast. It seemed very natural when i read daniel 3 that that is where this is coming from i mentioned the fact of the um influence of babylon in the book of revelation and that jerusalem is mystery babylon and because of that it really made the references to the image in daniel 3 in addition to the fact that it also talks about the beasts in Daniel. And of course, much of Revelation is focused on the book of Daniel as well. So uh, to refer to Babylon, the idolatry that's going on there, and then the fact that there was an image made that they were forced to uh, bow down and worship just uh, seemed to naturally flow. And when I learned that there was some history associated with the number 666 uh, in Babylon with their gods, that made it even more uh, important to me along those lines. I still respect the people who hold the chapter to be dealing with Nero, and I don't ever sort of, you know, if it's been a long-held belief, uh, just lay it aside very easily, and I'm always open to coming back to that view, but right now this is what makes sense to me, and so I'm I'm uh, just going to continue along that pathway in terms of my understanding of what's going on until I have uh, a better reason to to change it. Uh, but as we said, Nebuchadnezzar made this great image. He required all the people to fall down and worship it. And Daniel and his companions refused to do so, and they were cast into a burning, fiery furnace. So there were very serious consequences for not worshiping this image that had been set up by Nebuchadnezzar. And as I mentioned also, it was interesting that even that image had some uh, concepts of 666, not totally, but, you know, there were, it was 60 cubits high and uh, six cubits wide. And I'm thinking that if it has, you know, at least two sides to be measured uh, in terms of the depth, uh, then that would make it the same on all sides. But I'm not sure of that. The text does not say. Uh, we also spoke um, about the mark of the beast which comes from the imagery of that amulet worn by those in Babylon who worshiped idols. It was a medallion of sorts with the numbers one through 36 for each of their gods, which the people wore for protection against the evil uh, gods. And so the totality of the sum of those numbers, if you number them consecutively from one to 36, total up to 666. And there was an arrangement that they did 
on the medallion uh, in the form of a matrix that, uh, depending on which way you went, whether it was horizontal, uh, diagonal, or uh, vertical, uh, you still would get uh, a sum of 666. So I thought it was very interesting that uh, that existed. Now, because of Israel's designation as Mystery Babylon, the mother of harlots, the imagery, as I said, fits the character. And so without forcing uh, that symbolism, everything seems to kind of fall in place uh, from that perspective. We also note that Israel wore uh, patches of scripture on their foreheads and on their garments. Uh, you have Deuteronomy 6 and 8, uh, which is one text that may have been behind uh, their practice of that. Also, the priests wore a crown with an inscription of holiness to the Lord, Exodus 28, verse 36, and also chapter 39, verses 30 and 32. Now, we have in chapter 14 a mention of the 144,000 uh, for uh, a second time. They had been mentioned in chapter 7. Uh, this uh, reference to the 144,000 says that they were standing on Mount Zion. The text says, and I looked and behold a lamb standing on Mount Zion and with him 144,000 having his father's name written on their foreheads. Now, I believe in terms of this name that we're looking at the new name, which no one knew except the one who received it based on Revelation 2, 17, and also chapter 3 and verse 12. The scripture in 2, 17 says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat, and I will give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name written which no one knows except him who receives it. And I think you could see in the positioning of the 144,000 uh, in this chapter, that they are positioned as having overcome the beast and the mark of his name. Again, in Revelation 3 and verse 12, it says, He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from God, uh, from my God, and I will write on him my new name. So that seems to be the imagery that is ref uh, referred to with the 144,000 who uh, stand on Mount Zion with the, um, the lamb and this new name that they were given. And so it demonstrates, uh, based on what was written in the Old Testament by the, the priest who wore that name, it indicates holiness to the Lord and therefore says something about the fidelity of these 144,000. In addition, it also protects them uh, and protected them from being harmed by the beast. And so uh, it was a mark of seal or authentication uh, for them. You may remember back in chapter 7 and uh, verse 3, I believe it is, Revelation 7 and 3, uh, when he talked about the... Uh, calamity that was going to come he says after these things i saw four angels this is verse one by the way standing at the four corners of the earth holding the four winds of the earth that the wind should not blow on the earth on the sea or on any tree then i saw another angel ascending from the east having the seal of the living god and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea saying do not harm the earth the sea or the trees till we have sealed the servants of our god on their foreheads. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel who were sealed. And so it is generally understood. And of course, he enumerates all the tribes, et cetera. And, uh, but it's generally understood that these would represent the remnant from Israel. But let's uh, go on and see, you know, what the text reveals for us. Um, the 144,000 are seen, as we said, standing on Mount Zion with the Lamb. This also indicates that they are reigning because you have uh, them standing there, and so everything is under their feet from that uh, perspective. And so it's showing you, giving you a glimpse into the uh, future of the outcome in the book of Revelation before they get there. And so 
uh, with the lamb standing on Mount Zion. It's indicative of the fact that he is reigning in Mount Zion, as we find in Psalm 110. But nevertheless, uh, it says also, or it indicates, their victory over the beast. And so by standing with the lamb, uh, that's an indication of the fact that they have gained victory over the beast. And it parallels the scene in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 22 and 20, uh, 22 through 24, where the text says, But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels. Now, notice also in connection with this 144,000, it says that they had come to an innumerable company of angels. So you have the word innumerable mentioned here, and I will mention that again uh, a little bit later as we uh, go for forth. In addition, he uh, says to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, so this also indicates that they are celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles, which was prophesied in Zechariah chapter uh, 14, starting around verse 16 through 19, where it says all of those, all of the nations that the Lord had fought against, et cetera, would come to Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. And any nation, of course, who did not come up upon them, there would be no rain. So that's just indicative of the blessing of rain for which they gave thanks during the time that they were dwelling in booths at the time of the harvest. And so that's indicated here when it says that they had come to the general assembly. That word general assembly from Panaguri is the uh, festive occasion. And uh, that would be referring to the Feast of Tabernacles because it would be the time of the harvest. And that's what you see also in the book of Revelation is this uh, celebration and a Feast of Tabernacles. That's indicated in Revelation 7 and verse 9, uh, I believe, because it talks about them with palm branches in their hands. So if you go back to Leviticus chapter 23 and take a look at the text, and I want to say around th verse 34 and following, you will see that in the context. And also uh, looking in, in verse 9, where it says uh, that they were standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes with palm branches in their hands, that indicates that they have, have put on immortality, that this uh, concept of putting on immortality has been consummated. Uh, they have on the white robes, which indicates a transformation by the fact that they put on this clothing. And notice that corresponds with the uh, clean linen, fine and bright in Revelation 19. It refers to the garments that they are wearing in Revelation 16 that Jesus had counseled the church of the La uh, Laodicea to buy in uh, Revelation chapter 3. And therefore, uh, since this came as a direct result of washing themselves in the blood of the Lamb, indicating the fact that they had died with Christ through baptism, and Peter uh, stating in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which lives and abides forever, they put on incorruption, incorruptibility, imperishability when they are united with Christ in baptism. And that's the newness of life. And now it's coming to its uh, fruition, to its consummation, as indicated here in Revelation chapter uh, 14. And as we see in the parallel text of Hebrews chapter 12 as well. So they had come to this general assembly, to the church of the firstborn, who are registered in heaven to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. That concept of making them perfect is a resurrection context. It also refers to salvation, to the kingdom, etc. And you can see it used throughout the writings of Paul, whether in Corinthians, in Galatians, in Hebrews, and uh, in James, etc., uh, particularly in Hebrews 11, verses 39 and 40, where it says, these all died in faith, not having received the promise, God having provided something better for us that they, apart from us, should not be made perfect. Uh, in that verse, it's a reference to that better resurrection that they would receive in fulfillment of the promise of God. And likewise, Paul uses it in Philippians chapter 3, when he talks about uh, not having attained to the resurrection or were already made perfect. Uh, you can even see it when Jesus used the statement in Luke chapter 13, around verse 33 or so, 
when uh, they told him to get out because Herod was going to kill him. And he says, you go tell that fox, I do cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I shall be perfected, uh, referring to his resurrection. So uh, we could see uh, the correlation of that in Hebrews chapter 12, and that, of course, would carry over to, to uh, Revelation chapter 14 as well. And so this is a clear result of covenantal change and the consummation of that change, as we see in 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 3, from the ministration of death to the ministration of righteousness. Now, John hears a divine voice from heaven, like the voice of many waters, and this voice was loud like thunder. Uh, it is the antithesis of the meeting with God in Mount Sinai in Exodus chapter 19. In that event, the saints also heard loud thunder and voices, etc. And you can see both from Exodus 19 and from um, Hebrews chapter 12, where once they heard that voice, they didn't want to hear it anymore. And so they wanted Moses to represent them in speaking with God. But it says in Exodus 19 and verse 16, then it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there was thunderings and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountains. And the sound of the trumpet was very loud so that all the people who were in the camp tremble, uh, tremble. And therefore, this uh, great noise, this loud voice, etc., because of the presence of God, who had come down in the top of Mount Sinai, where the people were meeting with him, and of course Moses ascended up into the cloud in order to meet God. And so that's the idea of their standing on Mount Zion. It's like they are in the clouds at the very... Uh, summit of the mountain, the very top of the mountain. And so uh, you have that antithesis between Mount Sinai with Mount Zion and similar events occurring because of what's taking place uh, with uh, both of them. And then he's heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. That's another indication that the 144,000 represent the priest of the Old Covenant. Let's see what Stephen is saying this morning. He says, would it then also make sense to associate the perfect of 1 Corinthians 13 with the resurrection? Yes, of course. And that's why I mentioned 1 Corinthians uh, in the statement when I said that you will find that word perfect in 1 Corinthians 10. One point to look at, let me go over there very quickly and just point this out from 1 Corinthians chapter chapter 13, verses 10 through 12. Notice in 1 Corinthians, well, I went to chapter 10, <laughs> uh, chapter 13. It says, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now, this face to face presence of God is a um is correlated with the resurrection because now they see his face. If you may remember from the 17th Psalm, Psalm 17 and verse 15, David made a statement concerning seeing the face of God. Now, you have to understand just like Peter said on the day of Pentecost, uh David was both dead and buried, and his tomb was with us until this day. He has not ascended into the heavens. So David at the time was in Hades at the time of the writing of this psalm, but notice what he said. As for me, I will see your face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake in your likeness. That also corresponds with Daniel chapter 12, when he spoke of many who slept in the dust of the earth shall awake, and uh, some to everlasting life or the life of the age and some to everlasting condemnation. And then he says, many of those would, uh, who slept would turn many to righteousness. So the idea is awaking to righteousness. And in so doing, that's how you see the face of God. I think it's in Matthew. Yes. Uh, the Beatitudes chapter five, when he says, um, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, 
for they shall be filled. And again, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And so when you read 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and the verse is 34, the text, again, quoting from Daniel, says, Awake to righteousness and do not sin, for some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. So, yes, we must see that as an awakening to righteousness. Same thing in Philippians chapter 3. Paul said that I may be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. And in uh, verse 10 of Philippians chapter 3, uh, let's see, he says that he wanted to be conformed to Christ. Uh, let's see, verse 10. Yeah, so which which is through the faith of Christ, that's the last part of verse 9, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, being conformed to his death, if by any means I might attain to the resurrection out from the dead. So, yes, that concept of being made perfect in Philippians chapter uh, 3 I mean, uh, excuse me, yeah, Philippians 3, but particularly in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 12, is about seeing the face of God in righteousness that is resurrection. One more text to put with that, and that would be 2 Corinthians chapter 3, where the one hope was this transition and transformation out of the old covenant, the ministration of death, to the ministration of righteousness, which is the new covenant. And Paul said they were being transformed uh, from glory to glory, as by the Spirit of the Lord. And then when you go into chapter 4, uh, the, the text will talk about seeing the face of God in the presence of Jesus Christ. And so this is uh, certainly what is being spoken of and what is being referenced by seeing the face of God. All right, but as we were saying in uh, Exodus, excuse me, in um the correlation of the 144,000 with the priest of God, uh, that's another indicator that they represent the priests of the Old Covenant, all of whom were uh, Levites. And, uh, and this is important for us to, to grasp relative to the 144,000, that they are the priest of God. Remember it very early on in the book of Revelation in chapter 1, uh, verses 5 and 6. The scripture talks about their being made priest of God, he, as he says, uh, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead. So there's another reference to the firstborn. That's uh, once in Hebrews chapter 12, they were called the firstborn ones. This is important. I'm, I'll, I'll build on this in just a moment. But again, here in Revelation, they are called the firstborn. So he says, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead. Of course, that's referring to Christ, but uh, the in indication will be for the saints as well. Uh, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So they are a, a ruling kingdom of priests, just as... He had spoken in uh, Exodus 19, around verses 5 and 6, that God wanted them to be a kingdom of priests to him. And you find that in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9, where uh, he says that they were a holy priesthood, a, um, a holy nation, and a spiritual priesthood who were to offer up spiritual sacrifices to God through uh, Jesus Christ. And that's a reference to this being this new covenant priesthood that was based on the priesthood in the Old Testament, based on the Levites. Now, in Jeremiah, well, let's look at, uh, first of all, let's, let's look at Isaiah. In Isaiah 66 and verse 22, notice that Isaiah talked about these Levites that would be a part of the new covenant kingdom, a part of the new heavens and earth. He says, I will also take some of them for priests and Levites, says the Lord. These are those that were to be evangelized. And so he says, for as the new heavens and the new earth remains, which I will, I shall uh, make 
shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your descendants and your name remain. So not only would he make this priesthood, but he would make it an everlasting priesthood. They would continue, they would remain before him as the new heavens and the new earth. Jeremiah also shows that they are an innumerable company. So when we're looking at the 144,000 and we see this, this number which no man could number, we should be seeing them not literally as 144,000, but as this innumerable company of priests. The scripture says in Jeremiah chapter 33 and verse 17 and following, For thus says the Lord, David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel, nor shall the priests, the Levites, lack a man to offer burnt offerings before me to kindle grain offerings and to sacrifice continually. Now, those who are in these Hebrew roots type movements, Hebrew Israelites, et cetera, and um, whether they, you know, others who consider themselves Orthodox Jews, it's, you know, they get caught up in this language that applies to the New Testament. And they think that we're talking about literal Levites in the sense that they're going to have a bloodline um, priesthood being of the house of Aaron. You know, they're over there now talking about a red heifer that they got out of Texas, um, but nevertheless, and they see the word sacrifices and these animals, et cetera, to be offered, and they think this is literal in the sense that God is going to reconstitute the nation of Israel and they will be and build a new temple and they are going to be offering these sacrifices. Well, that is far beyond the prophetic scope here. This is just using the language in an accommodative way to talk about the priests in the New Testament who would offer, as we said in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, spiritual sacrifices acceptable to the Lord. And the Bible talks about that in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I, um, When he uh, speaks of the brethren, I'm trying to get the, trying to crank myself up here and, and get the start of that text. In Romans chapter 12, that says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And he says, and be not, do not be conformed to this age. What age was that? That was the age of Israel. That was the age of the old covenant. That was the age of the temple and the priesthood and the sacrifices according to Levi. But the scripture says, for the priesthood being changed, there is made also of necessity a change also of the law. For Moses, when he officiated, spoke nothing concerning priesthood. However, our Lord sprang out of the tribe of Judah. So the new priesthood is a priesthood after the order of Melchizedek, of which Moses spoke nothing concerning the priesthood. And so we're not talking about the Levitical priesthood here. We're talking about Levites used in a symbolic or metaphorical sense to refer to the priests of the New Testament who would come and offer these spiritual sacrifices as it mentioned or is mentioned in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 15, where he says, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to his name, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. And then he says, but do not forget to do good and to share for which such sacrifices God is well pleased. So we're talking about a whole different kind and nature of sacrifices for uh, the Levit Levitical, I mean, for the priesthood of the New Testament. Now, let's go on. The text also says, and the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah saying, and that's verse 19, thus says the Lord, if you can break my covenant with the day and my covenant with the night, so, shall, uh, so that there will not be day or night in their season, then my covenant may also be broken with David, my servant, so that he shall not have a son to reign on the throne and with the Levites, the priests, my ministers, and watch, and oh, as the host of heaven cannot be numbered, nor the sand of the sea measured, so I will multiply the descendants of David, my servant, and the Levites who minister to me. So this is where this concept of I looked and saw a number which no man could number comes from. This priesthood, the new people of God, would be innumerable, and that's what you have in Revelation chapter 7. And verse 9, the text says, After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, 
crying out with a loud voice saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Therefore, it is a victory song over the beast and over his image, as we see in Revelation chapter 15, verses uh, 3 and 4. John says, And I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire, and those who have the victory over the beast, over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God. So there are these harps that you see in Revelation 14. Uh, they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the saints, who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name. For you alone are holy, for all nations shall come and worship before you, for your judgments have been manifested. So that's Revelation 15, 4. This is uh, sort of a recapitulation of the scene of Revelation 14, but it indicates a little bit more information regarding the song that they sing, which is a victory over the mark, uh, over the beast and the mark of his name. And uh, we have another indicator that they are the priest of God, which is their singing. The Levites did not sacrifice. They were not considered as being agents in the atonement of sins, for it was the priest, the high priest, who was only to make atonement for him. Leviticus chapter 4, verse 26, and also to make atonement, uh, again, uh, Leviticus 12 and verse 8. But the duty of the Levite was the performance of vocal music, a, and a Levite became therefore disabled for service when he lost his voice. The object of the singing was to produce certain emotions. Uh, this object can only be attained by pleasing sounds and melodies. And according to uh, Moses Maimonides uh, in the Guide for the Perplexed, page 481, he says, accompanied by music, as was always the case in the temple. And then uh, we have the fact that they were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. Now, we are out of time, and what I will do is pick up on this point on next week, because I have a couple of points, and I know I won't finish them in the time, and I don't want to extend this um, too long. So let's pick up here on this point on next week, and we will continue our study of the 144,000 gaining victory over the mark of the beast and over his name and their celebration because there's some other very important things that we want to talk about. Remember to share the message with your friends, family, and others that uh, uh, we want to understand this message. In addition, uh, subscribe if you haven't subscribed or you know pass that link on to others as well. And then visit our, our YouTube channel uh, as well as the website. 14.6 really hits against the Hebrew Israelites under the Old Covenant. Israel was the people, if I'm not mistaken, but the gospel in Revelation 14 was for every people. Uh, that is correct, uh, uh, Stephen. And so uh, we will be touching on that as we move forward. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, Christian friends, thank you so much for tuning in this morning. We appreciate your uh watching. And again, please share the information with others. We will see you in the next broadcast, Lord willing, on next week.